Well, you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until five. This is the panel. It's all about Dublin and Mayo today. The ladies throwing in their All Ireland semi final at 3.45, then the men at six o'clock. By that time, there'll be 40,000 fans inside Croke Park. That match and the ladies game, the subject of the Saturday panel, to look ahead over the next hour and discuss this issue with Tyrone and Kerry. We're delighted to be joined by three champions. Mayo's former All-Ireland winner, Ladies Gaelic Player of the Year, 11-time All-Star and Australian footballer with the Giants, Cora Staunton, the former Dublin midfielder and five-time All-Ireland winner, Dennis Bastic, and the current manager of the Antrim Senior Footballers and a three-time All-Ireland winner with Tyrone, Enda McGindy. Enda, Dennis and Cora, you're very welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Great to be here. Just to begin, uh, folks, uh, before we get into match previews and all that kind of thing, it's always interesting to hear the experiences of champions. You're all champions at the highest level. Cora, you're free in 2003, uh, got Mayo that goal uh, when it was converted and that broke Dublin's hearts. Dennis, you were on the winning and losing side against Mayo in, in that brilliant uh, run of games. We're having the 10th one in a decade now today. And, and uh, you never lost an All-Ireland final. So I just kind of want to begin with experiences. Cora, like for the men, it's 70 years, this uh, famine, this curse since they last won the All-Ireland, uh, the Sam Maguire. Um, is that just a, a kind of thing for supporters and the media? Or is, is it a, very much a case that um, hope has been uh, uh, just broken at times? You've got to go again and again and again. I was coming home from Castle Bar in Westport last week from holidays and I saw the green and red and the flags. How would you keep on finding the hope for it? Yeah, well, I suppose it's it's the players. I think it's the fans and, and supporters and, and maybe people outside the county that look up, talk about, you know, 70 years and this too doing and stuff. I, I don't think it's the players at all, you know, buy into that. They're, you know, they're professionals. They, they All they want to do is go out and perform and Obviously, in Mayo's case, you know, win a Connacht title this year, get back to Division One, and 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 now to get to an All Ireland semi final against probably the best football team, possibly of all time. So, you know, for them, you know, there's there's boy, lads there, they're you know 19, 20, 21 that you know don't buy into that. I suppose the guys that are more experienced and have been around the block, the likes of the Aidan O'Shea's, Lee Keegan's, you know, they've probably lost a lot of all Ireland in, in the last decade you know all they want to do is finally try and get their hands on Sam so I don't think they buy into it you know football is all about processes now and you know doing exactly everything that you need um, you know in the build up to match day and then on match day it's obviously you know uh, follow a game plan so yeah I don't think they buy into it I think it's more supporters and media that to create this but you know it's, it's been a difficult um decade for Mayo you know um, especially against the Dubs I think this is their they haven't been beaten the Dubs in, in 17 games uh, I think 2012 in the semi-final was the last time they bet the Dubs so you know that may be um, in the mindset of, of the older players but certainly not in the younger players and I think with this team that James has, has built in the last two years there's a lot of youth there and you know they just got kind of go out and play a lot of free football. Have you shed a few tears along the way Cora as, a, as an observer as a fan? Uh, I don't know if I've, I've shed a few tears. Um, yeah, I've certainly been on the edge my, of my seat um, a lot of the time. Um, I think probably 2016, 17, um, you know, 15, 16, that, them years were, were probably the hardest. Um, it's very hard, I suppose, when you're, you've played football and, you know, when you're a supporter, you just have to sit and watch. Yeah, you just sit on the edge of your seat. Um, uh, it's, it, it's difficult, and you know, but that's the joys. You know, there's many county... Um, right throughout Ireland that would have loved to be a Mayo shoes too and, and been competing in many all Irelands and you know what they've done over the last I think year or two you know um, reinvigorate the team and a lot of people would have thought that Mayo's days were gone and you know especially after the number of retirees last year then obviously the blow with Killian and his injury and um, in the league semi-final against Clare a lot of people's hopes were dashed and probably a little bit less expectation on Mayo and people would see that getting back to division one and a Connacht title, you know, has been a good year for Mayo, but, you know, I don't think it's a good year for these Mayo boys until they, until they win Sam. Yeah, you have to admire the journey. It's almost like the journey has become more important than the destination, Cora. Nathan Murphy was telling me that, and obviously he's a, he's a proud, bally, honest man. Uh, Dennis Bastic, uh, Cora was referring to 2012 there. You were involved in that game when Mayo uh, blitzed Dublin. Can you just visualise for us what, what a Dublin-Mayo rivalry is like on the pitch, Dennis? Uh, it, it's been great, uh, obviously coming out on the right side of it most of the time, but those games, they've, they've actually thrown up everything to us. They've given us red cards, black cards, 
someone hitting the post, penalties, GPSs, drawn games, replays. Like they never failed to disappoint. So to be a part of that over a few years, that was yeah, it was really, really enjoyable and obviously to come out on the right side of them. To touch on your point earlier, I was uh, coming through the West and, and coming through Mayo last week myself and I couldn't get over the flags and the streamers and the bunting up all over the county. And if you look out the window here, you'd hardly even notice that uh, Dublin were in the semi-final here on our, on our side at the moment. So it's a big difference. I can see how everyone just gets behind their county and um, you know how it's, it must be special for, for those players driving around their county at the moment, seeing all the support that they get each and every year. Yeah, we had the, the final last December, Cora and Dennis, where there was obviously no fans, 40,000 in uh, today into Croke Park. It's an addiction, Cora. It's a complete addiction, I think. Oh, I mean, 2017, I thought Mayo should have won the game. They played as well as they could have played, and it was just an amazing final. But this is an addiction, and until they do it, they will never give up hope. Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think, obviously, Mayo, being a rural county, we're very um, GEA-driven. You know, while there's other sports happening in, in you know, the county, it's, it's very much GEA. Everyone, young boy and girl that grows up, the first place you go to is the GEA club, um, you know, we, we, we kind of really passionate about it. And, and Mayo sports have been, you've seen over the years, whether it's the FBD League and in January in McHale Park or, you know, if it's the, the Ireland's be final, they go out and they're, they're trans to it. Like we've had, you know, first round of the National League, we've had 10 or 15,000 um, people at it. So, yeah, I think obviously the wait and then how long it's been, I think um, adds to that. But they're, they're type supporters that never give up and, you know, always encouraging, and I suppose any little bit of hope they have, and, and they kind of see it this year with, 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 with so called Dublin not being as strong as other years, you know, that's debatable. But, you know, there's that little bit of hope that they see that Dublin aren't performing as well as they usually do in the last couple of rounds. So that's given the Mayo fans, you know, some hope. But I suppose that the realism is, you know, the players, you know, kind of live in this little bubble, and, and as I said, all their they're worried about getting the job done and, and performing and you know yeah while the support is great and, and you know they, they love it and they love running out to a you know full crop park you know to them it's you know Saturday at six o'clock when the ball is thrown in you know for the 70 75 minutes that they'll fight as hard as they can to, to reach all Ireland and we have the fans back as Cora is saying there they're the fabric of the association and the country and the McGinley uh they are the lifeblood, the volunteers who go to these games and, and, and an expensive business at times. But when you were playing, like obviously we had an all Ireland final last year with no fans. When you were playing these matches in 03 and 05 and 08 and the McGinley, do you notice the crowd? Do you get lifted by the crowd or is the crowd just a blur in your experience? Most of the time the, the crowd is a blur because the, the nature of those all Ireland campaigns, you, you play in front of progressively bigger crowds uh, the whole year. So in terms of sheer number, uh, you, you could be as nervous going out or feel the crowd as much at a at a club championship game where there's only several thousand in, but they're right on top of you and it's very, very passionate. The, the sheer size of sometimes the big uh, county crowds, it does just change into a, a, a blur or you feel this murmur or this noise, like the, the couple of standout moments for me in terms of the crowd where really just even on the pitch, even in the focus of a big game and trying to play the big game that you just, it just had such an impact or you really noticed it was the famous sequence, the famous Tyrone tackling sequence in 2003, which was right in underneath the Hogan stand. And with every hit, the roar just got louder and louder and Tyrone always would have liked the Hogan stand in terms of our supporters. And I remember that it was just driving on and, and it felt like a real landmark moment in the game and for that team. And so it proved the other time. And this is what Dublin will miss. Dublin was so partisan whenever you were playing. Whenever you were playing Dublin, we didn't play Dublin in Ireland final. It was sort of quarterfinal stages. We often played them at during that time. And so it was a very partisan crowd. You had 60, 70,000 dubs and 10, maybe 15,000 throne ones down at it. Uh, and one of them games, we were well up. We were seven, eight points up. And then the Dublin comeback started. Now, when you, when you had Dublin on the back foot, the, the crowd was quiet. But whenever they started a comeback, the crowd just came in. And I remember they got four, five, six points in a row. And the place was rocking. Now, the nature of that Toronto team was we, we loved that, that. You were on the pitch and you were absolutely loving that, even though you were in the back foot in the game. That's It's games like that that you really become alive for, for both players, particularly the Ireland final like last year, it is just a, it's such a miss whenever you don't have the supporters in. They absolutely do make it, uh, without a doubt. The colour and the tension, that you can sense the tension from them. And speaking of the tension, the Throne Armagh games, 
wouldn't have been maybe sometimes full houses in Group Park, but the sheer tension was as much in the supporters as it was in the players on the pitch. I think for the 40,000 that are there uh, today, 40,000 in Group Park, it, it's, it's a big difference. You could put 40,000 in another stadium and it's an amazing atmosphere. I think the Group Park atmosphere and the, 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 the maybe the hill could be empty. It'll probably have some people on it, but it'll not have that same colour. So that is a definite miss. But certainly, having put up with what we've put up over the last several months or a year, uh, you'll take the 40,000 anytime because it does, it adds massively to the occasion. Particularly, I have to say, in terms of Cora, the Mayo supporters, like you, you just have to take your hat off them. They are they are phenomenal. Like it's hard to see that there's better supporters in the land. You know, they're, they're immense in what they've come through. You talk about tension there, and, uh, and Dennis, like 2013, a point between you, uh, Dublin and Mayo, when you won. The previous year, he lost by three. Uh, 2015, went to replay the semi-final. 2016, the final went to replay. 2017, a point in it. Um, you had to motivate yourself, Dennis. You had to get yourself on edge. You had to almost uh, create this um, uh, fire in the belly so you could overcome this great Mayo team. What what stood out vividly for you? Like what like things like like what Jim would have said in the dressing room. Um, individual battles you would have had. When you're like reflecting on your career on those Dublin Mayo battles, what would flicker in your mind from time to time when you think back? Um, probably the standout would be the physicality of the games, you know, and very much the way kind of form went out the window. It didn't matter how well Dublin had been going or how well Mayo had been going prior to those games. Those games just took on a life of their, of their own and Mayo definitely upped, upped their um, games towards us. And you know they were just so close, so tight. There was the odd, the odd one where we won by a couple of points, um, but the majority was just so tight. And to, to touch on the fans and the supporters, we've been outnumbered in terms of fans in some of those games, um, which is a great testament to the to the mayor supporters. But there's definitely that edge in the crowd, um, you know, just coming from knowing each other so well, and a bit of hostility in the fans between the fans, and it leads out onto the pitch as well. But you know. To be honest, the, the standout would be probably the physicality of those games and, and people really going toe-to-toe, loads of matchups all over the pitches, certain guys with certain roles to play. And just just it was just fantastic to be to be involved in them. And you know, that that's what I would say. Just everybody going flat out 100 percent 100 miles an hour, and it just showed them and they were spectacles for everyone to, to watch. I was even in my research for this, Dennis, uh, going through YouTube clip. You, I think you're training top on. Are you pushing Aidan O'Shea in the back? Was there, was there a bit of an uh, argy-bargy at one stage? <laughs> That's highly unlikely, I'd say, Charles. <laughs> yeah, look, um, look, being around the middle and Aidan being there, and, and yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a strong man. And, you know, a standout memory for me in early on would have been um, him dispossessing me under the under the Hogan stand during a game, a big turnover. It was in 2012 when they lost that game. and. You know, that stood with me from, from that point on. I never carried into contact with Aidan O'Shea. I used to pass it before I get to him, you know. But, should uh, he be on the edge of the square, Dennis, uh, today, you think, from a male perspective? Should be should he be in a full forward? I, I don't think you should pigeonhole him into. This game is going to ebb and flow, I think. So, you know, you need to be flexible. We've seen that with positions. You know, the game is going to go so many different ways. So I wouldn't just be saying put someone somewhere for... Definitely try it out, but I wouldn't be pigeonhole anyone into a certain position for the full game. And when we talk about Dublin, Dennis, in, in 2012, you'd won the All-Ireland. You'd, you'd broken that 16-year hoodoo. You were you're played against Kerry that year in 11. And then in 12, it didn't go that great. I mean, you, you, you beat Leash by three points. You beat Mead by three points. Are you seeing something similar this year that people are talking about it being a workmanlike campaign in Leinster? Are there signs that Dublin are maybe not firing on all cylinders? Or do you maybe not subscribe to that point of view that's out there at the moment? Look, there's, there's definitely comparisons to the both years and 2012 sticks out in my mind. Coming back off the back of that All-Ireland and you think, you think you're think you okay until you, you realise that you're not okay. You know, so we were we were not firing all cylinders and we found out the hard way, you know, found out in the semi-final and, and that was that. So, look, I still think that this team has the ability to win and, and could quite possibly will win today. But at the same time, if they were beaten you might lead to say, well, all the signs were there of, of Dublin being undercooked. And are there signs that Dublin are coming back to the pack? When you were Tyrone, when you had your fallow years, can you feel it? Can you feel that mm, maybe we're not at the pitch that we should be at? 
Hey, I think Dennis nailed it there. I think there is a potential for, for Dublin to get beat today and for everybody to look back saying, OK, those signs were there. But equally, the, the thinking about this game before coming on this today, the, the two comparison moments uh, for key teams in the past was our own team, the Tyrone team in 2008, where we had been knocked out early in the Ulster Championship, built ourselves back through the back door, actually got over Mayo in the final round of the qualifiers and then played Dublin in a really wet day in Croke Park. And we were being completely written off. It was only a matter of time before we had been put out of our misery and put out. Our team was older. It was done. We'd lost our fire, et cetera, et cetera. Within the camp, we were just waiting for our chance. Uh, we were the type of team and personality-wise that it wasn't until a big team limbered on the horizon and we were sort of coming in. We, we had a big point to prove that we stepped up and we blew Dublin out of the water that day. Uh, the other team then was the following year, actually. Kerry got put out, I think, early in the, in the Munster Championship came through the back door again, limped through various games. They had a team full of all Ireland winners themselves at that stage, not similar to Tyrone in 08. Uh, and they played again Dublin in the quarterfinal and blew Dublin out of the water. And I think we're, we're at a great risk in trying to look for the reasons that this could be the day that Dublin get beat, that we forget just the sheer quality of that team and the sheer potential for them whenever they really get in the mood uh, there's been nothing so far this year for that team to really like what what would that team have gained from playing to their absolute fullest potential and eventually like the incredible thing has been that they have so rarely dipped over the previous years but at some stage for those top players they can't get to this sh- their absolute top top level whenever they know deep down in their hearts that they don't need to on that given day uh, the, the questions the narrative coming into this game for me those are generational quality players and they're now being questioned that usually gets a response and if that Dublin team really responds just like Tyrone in 08 and Kerry 09 when you had great teams that people were really really openly questioning for the first time there can be quite a kickback uh, and if we look at the relative inexperience on the Mayo side that we're saying can take down what is the greatest football team there, there's been uh, I think quietly inside that Dublin camp if there's going to be a day for them to, as the cliche says, sort of send send, send, send out a, a warning or send out notice that they haven't gone away, uh, it could well be today. So again, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it could be one or the other here. They could get beaten. We'll say, oh, well, the signs were there. Absolutely. We could see it all along. Sure, sure of course we could see it. Uh, but for me, having been a team in that situation and seen other big teams in that situation, there can that is still a massively high quality Dublin team, uh, and I think we we are are judging Leinster games where they didn't have to be at their best and saying that that's where they're at in a strange COVID year where they they have been time in the run. Uh, I I think that we'll see a, a true reflection of where Dublin are at today. And Cora, as Enda was saying there, you have to have as well an impact of the fact that Stephen Cluxton is not around and Jack McCaffrey is not around and Paul Mannion is not around. That has to have an impact in terms of the absolute pitch that Dublin can perform to. Yeah, I, I think it has to have an impact, but that impact is only going to come, you know, as we can see that they don't have a stronger bench as they have had in other years. Their bench, in comparison to Mayo's bench, you know, is every bit as strong. You know, I think... Um, if you look at both benches, they're equal. So yeah, there, there is that. They're probably not as strong as the war 15, 16, 17 with the caliber of player that come off the bench. But the caliber of player that they have starting, in my eyes, are, are as good as ever. And I, I do think it's a thing that everyone has decided, you know, to, you know, because of performances in Leinster. And, um, you know, as Inda and Dennis re- rightly said, they don't really have to get up um, to perform to a level. You know, they, they just needed to get over the line. And it's not even that they got over the line. They were, you know, Kildare never looked like they were going to beat them. There was a spell in the Mead game where Mead came back at them, but Dublin were always in control. So, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, you can look at these players gone. Cluxton gone is probably the biggest of, of you know, of them all gone. But, you know, Evan Comfort has have stepped in. You know, his kickouts have been very good and, and he's marshaled the troops very well. So, yeah, we, we will have to see today with, you know, um, probably 10, 15 minutes to go when they spring these players from the bench. And, you know, if Dublin are under pressure at that stage, can these players... Um, like the Basquells, um, you know, Philly McMahon, he's experienced. So can the likes of these players, depending on um, whoever comes on, can they um, really inspire Dublin 
when, when they're needed if they're under pressure. But, you know, that's Mayo having to have a, you know, super, um, you know, open 55, 60 minutes where, you know, they're within a point or two or Dublin and they are even ahead of them at that time. Then we'll see whether their, you know, so-called lesser stars, can they shine, um, you know, in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the game. Is, is it the case, Dennis, that with uh, Stephen Cluxon, like Evan Comerford is a, is a very good goalkeeper. Is it more of a leadership issue with Stephen Cluxon? You shared a dressing room with him for many years that you're just missing his presence almost. Is, is that more of a factor? 100%, yeah, 100%. It's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's more down to knowledge, knowledge uh, and leadership that you're, that's what's missing out of the bank rather than, you know, the presence on the field or uh, Evan's ability. So, and that, that's, it is a big void in the dressing room. But those other guys stepping up now to have three, four, five All Irelands already as as young as young men, you know. So it is a big loss, but at the same time, there's enough there, I think, to to fill the gaps. I I think one of the remarkable things about Cluxon it really showed in last year's Mayo game, like he he was human, and a lot of the time people thought the Dublin kickout was just infallible and they always got it away. But when you really looked at them games, there was phases of them games. Kerry done it and even Mayo done it at times where Dublin lost three, four kickouts in a row and quite often lots of teams around the country, whenever that starts to happen in the game, you can really sense the team cracking on the pitch. Cluxon just he had complete uh, confidence and even though he could lose three, four in a row, I think there was one game there was four, almost five in a row where, where he lost and he just he kept pinging them and he turned the game actually he in that same game it was that game he released Jack McCaffrey for for the famous goal uh, where McCaffrey sprung up the wing so that ability of Cluxton to as all big players have to do you will have your rough games and as goalkeepers it's really really focused on you and we know Mayo love to press the kick out and they've done that again Dublin in the past that composure of Cluxton to ride out those spells and for the team out the pitch to have 100% confidence that even if he's going through a rocky spell, they know, look, boys, just stick to the script. We'll get this out. Uh, Comerford is massively impressive and he's had an apprenticeship like no other. But until you pass that test, that question will be there. And I have no doubt uh, James Horn will be thinking, we want to put the press on and possibly, possibly, We'll see if Comerford copes with that in the same way we clutched and proved time and time again, or whether that might be a wee chink in the armour. I would imagine Comerford will pass that test, but that's a test I'd imagine Mayo will absolutely want to be asking, can we turn over two, three kickouts, and then can we see what happens? Have the outfield players the same bulletproof confidence in Cluxton or in Comerford as they obviously had in Cluxton? Will they be pressing, Cora? Do you expect Mayo to be intense and aggressive uh, and pressing up early doors against the, the Dubs? Yeah, um, I, I think if they don't, then that's game over. I think that has to be Mayo's game. I think yeah, that's right from the, uh, the off. And that's what they've done against Dublin in the past. And even against Galway, they put their the Galway goalkeeper who was quite inexperienced under huge pressure. Well, yeah, I think from the, from the start, Mayo has to get a really good start, I think. Against Dublin, you seen it last year in the All Ireland. You know that goal from Dean Rock and um, from the throw in. Um, you know, obviously we we cannot be conceding goals early. So yeah, while we can't, you know, probably play our all out attack, we have to be, you know, quite mindful of not conceding a goal early on. But yeah, we have to be aggressive in their face. And I think Mayo do that quite well. Mayo are a very good tackling team. We need to, um, you know, around whether it's you know from the forward line, forward line down, and they need to be you know high pressure tackling the team. And I, and I think. That's where um, people probably have missed it with Killian being out. Yeah, he's a massive loss from a leadership point of view. He's a massive loss from a, a scoring point of view, a free-taking point of view. But Killian's a, Killian was an unbelievable tacker, tackler and puts a lot of pressure on, you know, any defence coming out and, and has done that, um, you know, against Dublin on numerous occasions. So we need the likes of the newer boys in, the likes of Ryan O'Donnell, who's doing it quite well, Tommy Conroy, and um, depending on Darren McHale, the likes of these players to you know really be in Dublin's faces and, and not let them out of their defence too easy. Okay, uh, thanks. It's go on. A, yeah, it's always been a tactic to go after Dublin's kickouts, even when Stephen Cluxon is there. So, you know, it's part of other teams' game plan, and I think it's a crucial element if the team's going to beat Dublin to get success on that. So a lot of talk about is someone going after Evan Comerford's kickouts, but they'd actually be doing the exact same if Stephen Cluxton wasn't goal. So, but it's it's not sustainable, I don't think, for the full seventy or eighty minutes to do that. So they're going to have to come up with, you know, whether it be set plays or after scores or whatever. Kerry has done that in the past, so maybe a combination. But it'd be quite difficult to go full press uh, for for eighty minutes. I'd say. 
OK, Dennis, I've asked the correspondent and Emma McGinley, thanks for the moment. We'll be back with more of our Dublin Mayo preview, ladies and men's football semi-finals after this break. Well, you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk, where Dublin versus Mayo, men's and women's semi-finals is the subject of this week's Saturday panel. Delighted to be in the company of three special guests this afternoon. Mayo's former All-Ireland winner, Player of the Year, an Australian footballer with the Giants, Cora Staunton. The former Dublin midfielder and five-time All-Ireland winner, Dennis Bastic, And the current boss of the Antrim Senior Footballers, a three-time All-Ireland winner with Tyrone and McGinley. Cora, I'll start with you. First of all, are you heading back down under for next year? Do you know yet? Yeah, um, I head down um, probably sometime in October. Um, I'll have to give a stint here to, to the club. So, yeah, I'll stay around for a club championship and... Um, whenever that uh, finishes, I'll head back out. But yeah, I think in sometime around October. But again, uh, situation in Sydney at the moment, COVID-wise, isn't too good. So we just have to wait and see. What was the experience like? You got into the team of the year. That must have been pretty uh, rewarding for you. Uh, yeah, the experience has been brilliant. Um, obviously, it's, it's a, a different game to Gaelic football. But obviously, living the professional lifestyle and... Um, a new game, challenging yourself. Yeah, it's it's been amazing. The experience has been amazing. You know, it's um, I'm going into my fifth year down there now. So yeah, I love it. Um, you know, still improving all the time. A um, lot of things that I still don't know about the game and have to try and get better at. But yeah, so far, um, you know, the journey down there has been brilliant and the competition has grown. And you know, four new teams are announced during the week that will come in and the season after next. So yeah, it, it's getting bigger and bigger. But yeah, I have loved my time down there so far. I know there are Irish girls playing as well and you're developing a community. Is, is there much of a, a close-knit community down there and down under? Yeah, there is. Obviously, there's. Uh, we'll have, I think, 14 um, Irish girls in the competition um, and I only expect that number to grow um, 14 next year. So, yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, so Breed Stack is w- with me in the club. So, yeah, there's a huge Irish community in, in Sydney anyways. And, you know, um, I often go down to a couple of the GA clubs to, to take a couple of training sessions. So, yeah, you'll always see plenty of Irish in, in Sydney. Do they show matches on TV over there? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, all the matches are, are, are shown live on two channels over there, yeah. So um, all our all our matches, every round, um, you know, prelims, finals, everything. So, yeah, it's massive. It's, it's grown massively, um, the ladies' game. You know, it's only in se- going into season seven, so it's only seven years old. And as I said now, from uh, 2023, they'll have the full 18 teams like the men in the competition, so... Yeah, it's, it's only going to take off and I can imagine what it's going to be like over the next five years. A lot of talk, I'm sure, as well about Jim Steins was such a legend down there in, in, in the men's game in, in Aussie rules. Yeah, there is. Um, he's, he's um, you know, again, this week there's a uh, Jim Steins um, award that Melbourne have um, and the AFL have every year. And I know this has been spoken about um, in the last um, kind of 10 days. So, yeah, he's a massive icon down there, especially if you go around to down to Victoria and, and Melbourne in particular, and obviously the two Irish girls um, in Sinead Goldrick and Lauren McGee are at the Melbourne club. So, yeah, he's a, he's a massive figure, as is, you know, obviously Ty Kennelly in, in Sydney. And, um, you know, he, he's been a massive, obviously, when his, his premiership, and even when I've been over there, he's been a, a massive help to me. Uh, do you give yourself a chance against the Dubs in the ladies' semi-final today, Cora? A bit like the men, that they've had a few in a row and, and you're trying to upset them. Yeah, it's, you know, it's obviously very difficult. Um, you know, Dublin are the standard bearers of, of, of ladies football for the last probably um, since 2017, you know, when they won their first All-Ireland, but, they you know, they'd lost three in a row and previous to that. So, uh, yeah, while you always give them a chance and Mayo have a, a, quite a young team, you know, a quick team, yeah, you, you, I, I certainly give them a good chance. Um, going in, I, I think it's going to be def- difficult. I think uh, Dublin are red hot favourites for the All Ireland this year, but yeah, I, I do think I'll give them a good chance. It's very hard to tip against Dublin because um, of of their form, um, winning the national league, and, and obviously winning. I think they're going for five in a row. So um, yeah, I give I give me a chance, but you, you probably have to uh, if you're a betting person, you probably have to uh, tip Galway or tip um, Dublin. If they are to upset them, is there any kind of tactical basis for that? Do you think is it getting goals? Is it what, what, or is it Dublin having an off day? What are what are the key matchups? Yeah, I think it's um, certainly they'll have to they'll have to score goals. And I think the biggest thing with the Dublin ladies is that they've really brought ladies football to a different le- level of physicality. And and like they spoke earlier in the program, you know, you kind of carry the ball into the tackle um, if any of the Mayo players decide to, to, to carry the ball into that tackle, especially in the Dublin defence, they're going to be swallowed up. So I think it's really going to be quick 
fast football and um, getting the ball you know we have a very exciting inside forward line with a lot of pace um, so let's try and get the ball in early you know obviously challenge Dublin early it's, it's going to be a big game for, for Mayo a lot of them younger girls wouldn't have played in Co Park where Dublin are obviously very used to it over the last number of years so yeah it's to settle well early and I, I just think to use the ball and and try not bring the ball into tackle. Cork and Meath how would you assess that match tomorrow the second semi-final? Yeah, that's that's probably the harder of the two to decide. Um, you know, obviously me, they're ma- you know are the ones that have surprised everyone um, this year, coming out intermediate last year, beating Westmead, um, and then obviously beating our man in the quarter final. A lot of people were surprised at, at that. You know, me, they've won Division Two this year, um, and obviously they played a Cork earlier on in a group game um, in the second round and only lost them by two points. So. Um, it, it's going to be a very, very, very tight one. Um, Cork are w- w- without their one of their main stars in Orla Finn, their main scoring forward. So, so that's a that's a huge blow to them. So I, I wouldn't really be surprised, John, if this one is a draw, or you know, if you'd um, if fancy me to win it. It's go- it's going to be very close, um, and one I'm really looking forward to. Very good. That's uh, tomorrow afternoon, and we got the Dubs Mayo ladies and men's uh, today. Six o'clock throw in for the for the men's match. Anna McGinley. Um, you, when, in 03, there was a degree, I think, of innocence about Tyrone. You were quite a young team. You come through the minors under 21s with Mickey Harsh, then you won the All Ireland. Maybe you didn't have time to think about it. When I'm looking at these Mayo players, some of them, Matthew Ruan, Darren McHale, Ryan O'Donoghue, um, maybe they don't have the baggage. Is there such a thing as a psychological barrier when it comes to the, the, these matches? Or as Cora was saying earlier on in the show, it's now about process, it's now about the minutiae of the game. No, oh, I'd agree. I think that. that that youthful, be it naivety or confidence, whatever you want. Uh, but there is something that comes with a young player coming through. And uh, they obviously would have had huge confidence in James Horn. And I think Kieran McDonald is such an iconic player in his own right and the way he carries himself, the way he played the game. I think that has infused itself into this Mayo team too. But yeah, it was funny thinking that today. Like there's been... S- like people are talking a lot about the fact that this is game is a 10 in the current series of this Dublin Mayo saga. But for me, really, the, the extent of change in that Mayo team, part of it due to obviously retirement, part of it obviously unfortunately forced with, with injuries this year. Uh, but it is a massive, massively changed team to such an extent that I don't think we, we can really go on previous performances for this team. We have to look at them as a new team. For a lot of those players... Uh, some of them have under 21 all Ireland obviously that, that they won several years ago uh, and that gives a huge confidence to a young player coming through that, that you can take on anybody in Ireland uh, but absolutely youth has a big say and will help the Mayo team possibly play without fear but to be honest and Cora mentioned it at the start I think time and time again looking in from the outside you've just wondered how do them boys cope with it how do them boys cope with another losing All Ireland final banquet, like I never experienced it. I was at the Throne one whenever Throne lost theirs. Recently, there are horrible things, and that Mayo team has been through it numerous times. And you just question how do they keep coming back, and yet they do. Uh, so, I think if there was a team that has shown an ability to not carry psychological baggage, it seems to be Mayo. And I think the young players will only have will will only carry that more. Like they they have carried the fight to Dublin in a way that no other team in the country really managed to do consistently. Uh, and they'll take huge pride from that. And these young players, having watched those big battles uh, previously and not been involved, will will really fancy their their chance at it. Whether they're as good as the boys that they replaced from that sort of the, the peak of that era, 15 to 17, we'll, we'll find out today. Uh, Dennis, yeah, like uh, Matthew Rowan is really impressive midfield, isn't he? Hasn't he? Like Brian Fenton is a Rolls Royce player, one of the best players to ever play the game, but he won't have it all his own way in that midfield with Connor Loftus and Matthew Rowan today. And what they'll hope, Mayo, is that they'll have runners and they'll have players come in from defence to, 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 to run at Dublin. Yeah, I think we've seen a bit of a shift around the middle of the park where it's gone towards the mobility and athleticism and, and those two guys definitely bring that to the game. So, look, Brian Fenton is usually targeted in terms of being man-marked and trying to negate him as much as possible. So, no doubt, Mayo have something planned for them, uh, for him to try and negate his influence on the game. But what we have found that out in the past is that it's so difficult to curtail him. He's just that good over such a long period of time that He's going to come into the game at different stages and, and make an impact. But definitely the, the, the mobility of the two midfielders for Mayo has, has really impressed me. And 
they have experience now from last year as well. And, and to touch on another guy there, Tommy Conroy, who, who didn't have his best game in the, in the final last year after doing really well coming in. Like I'm sitting back saying that that guy is probably waiting for his chance since the, since the final whistle of that last game to get back there, get back into Crow Park, get back against Dublin. And here he now has a chance today to you know, put in a big, big performance. And the worry about it is Ocean Mullen might not be fit. We will have to wait and see what happens, Cora. Like I mean, he's so crucial to to Mayo already, even though he's such a young player, uh, Paddy Durkin as well. But for, going forward, can they do it without Kelly and five forty in the championship last year, Cora? They'll have to get a few goals, surely. They'll have yeah. to get twenty points. Yeah, I, I think that's the big question. And you know, the injury cloud over Oshie Mullen, you know, is huge as well. Even though there's huge pressure on his shoulders, you know, at twenty one years of age and I'm um, only his second year in with Mayo, but you know, he gives them something, you know, from the back and driving forward. And, you know, obviously he probably would have been targeted um to mark one of their main men, probably Conor Callahan. But yeah, go- going forward, I think that's the biggest question. Can Mayo score enough to beat um to beat this Dublin team? And you know, I don't think we're really going to know that, that um till on the day. Um the first half can score where you'd have said not. Um, you know, Mayo were, were quite poor, they were lethargic, um, you know, there there wasn't that much movement in the forward line and they really struggled against Galway. Um and I, I think it was only when they got going in the second half. And I think Aiden's placement in the full forward line, that kind of vocal point at full forward really gave the likes of Tommy, um, Conroy in particular, um, and Ryan O'Donnell who at times um a, a little bit of pressure was taken on because off, off them because Aiden was inside and, and he was the focal point. So, you know, the other defenders maybe had to concentrate a little bit more on him. So I do think Aiden's placement and, and where he plays, and I know Dennis spoke about earlier. I do agree with him. I don't think he can be um, played in a full forward um, all the time because there's needs. He's, there's times he's needed out around the middle. Um, but I, I do think that they're going to need um, for for them to score uh, score a lot and score enough in this game. They're going to need a, 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 a likes of Aidan O'Shea inside to create a bit of havoc. And I think the likes of Tommy Conroy, Ryan O'Dunn, who whoever it is, Darren McHale, the likes of these players can can feed off him. So I think that's really important. Um, and at times I think. Um, well, you know, when Aiden has played against Dublin, probably has struggled a time to, to to get on the score sheet. And we're going to need we're going to need a performance from him. We're going to need a couple of scores from him. You know, because while our forwards have have been scoring a bit in in recent games, you know, hasn't been against you know quality opposition. Barry Galway, uh, I do think that we're going to need you know Matt Ruan came from and scored one one two against Dublin. Set up or against Galway, set up the penalty, and, and we've had uh, you know the likes of Patrick Durkin and put guys from the back getting their scores. So we're going to need a lot more from that forward line, and I think it's going to be all based around where where Aiden is placed. Uh, Conor Callahan, Kieran Kilkenny, Niall Scully, Dean Rock. You can mention all these match winners, and McGinley. How how solid are Dublin defensively in your view at the moment? I think they're 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 solid but I, I suppose to be honest we haven't seen them fully tested but they where the forwards they've, they've probably got their seven eight main main forwards defensively they did look a bit stretched but obviously the returning merchant returning john small have, have will will help them in that regard i think the the balance the the speed in that mayo full forward lane will will worry them a wee bit a uh, the big benefit for them is and this is where the, the killian o'connor loss is is key for mayo killian o'connor took dublin's best probably defender mick, mick fitzsimmons to mark him previously and suddenly when he, and whenever you've got a key key clear match winner potential player like that on the pitch that draws a lot of other surrounding defenders' eyes onto him at all times. Always, you're there watching their own man, and they've got half an eye on him as well. Mayo, if Aidan O'Shea isn't in at full forward, don't have that out and out threat like Tommy Connery, Ren O'Donoghue, Darren McKeel. Absolutely good players, but they are players that Dublin expect to be their individual men to be able to cope with. Whereas Killian O'Connor is that wee bit extra and brings that wee bit of extra threat, and that often buys other men a wee bit more space. And I suppose that adds the argument of about deploying Aidan O'Shea inside. But absolutely, uh, I'd agree with both both Dennis and Cora. I, I don't think that can be a permanent uh, thing in the game, and I think everybody will be moving about anyway. But in Mick Fitzsimmons, Davy Byrne, I, I think those defenders are excellent. Johnny Cooper is excellent, and then it's the likes of Merchant. I love Johnny Small. I hate Johnny Small, but I love him as a defender too. He he is the equivalent of what we had in terms of Ryan McManaman and, and Connor and Connor Gormley, like the, the guy you love to hate, but you would love him in your own team because he does 
he loves defending. He loves being a nightmare for, for his opposing man. Uh, so from a defensive point of view, it has always been flagged up as Dublin's potential weak link. But that's only for me because everything else looked so perfect. Okay, well, we'll, we'll look at their defence then. Uh, but very few teams have truly torn them asunder. I, I think looking at how Mayo attack, how Mayo in that second half against Galway, and the way they struggled a wee bit in the first half, it's clear that Mayo's greatest strength at the minute is their all-out running game. Uh, but I don't think they've come up against a team with as big a capability to track them runners as Dublin have. But also Dublin have the option of sitting back a wee bit deeper and letting Mayo run on to them. Because I think in a crowded uh, defence, the likes of them new forwards will struggle a wee bit to have the same impact. They'll want that wee bit of space and them strong runners coming through. So there's an obvious tactical choice there uh, for Desi Farrell to take if he wants to shut down Mayo because I think, looking at it, they are, with the loss of Killian O'Connor, more reliant on a running game. Uh, and that running game can be negated if 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 you choose to do so. So, Dan, so what I'm just saying there, what is the best tactical choice for Desi to... Uh... Uh, have the platform for Dublin to win this game and, and reach the final again. I don't think they're going to change too much from from the norm. You know, they're, they're, it's quite a simple game in terms of the kickouts. They just look for a lot of movement and, and try and look for for breaks and, and gaps to try and get the kick off kick out off quickly. To try and move the ball uh, quickly up to the forwards as quickly as possible, and then if that's not on, they just they have that patience element that, that nobody likes looking in at, where they just control the ball, comfortable on the ball, go through the hands, and try and probe and try and create gaps where they can can pick off a score from from the D, a high percentage shot. So they're not going to change, um, but I think what you might see is an increase in tempo, an increase in. You know, maybe aggressiveness and and yeah, a bit more bite about them because no doubt the the murmurs and the noise from around about this Dublin team is creeping into the camp. It's that it's, that's only natural. And then, um, you know, you're talking about guys like maybe Dean Rock, James McCarthy, Johnny Cooper, who's who are being written off maybe, or or maybe this is their time where they're they're going to lose. So you know, I'll be like what Enda said earlier. I'll be expecting a bit of a kickback now in this game today. You talking to anybody, Dennis, uh, Niall Scully, or uh, anybody like giving you a kind of a vibe about um, the most? If I said be using it, I wouldn't be, they wouldn't talk to me again ever. So yeah, well, not... well, well, we want to invite you back, Dennis. So if that's fair enough. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, look, um, look um, I, I would just think that you know the kind of season kicks off now. I think that's you know whatever about the previous games and a lot goes on. We would have seen it in other years, but until you get to the business end and. We've got the, the four best teams left, and that's um, that's how it stands. And I think that automatically just tunes up everything in training. It tunes up everything um, all around the camp, all around and everything they do. Um, and I think we'll see that then from, from both sets of teams. Can uh, Mayo negate the Dublin forwards, Cora? Because it's such a rich quality of talent, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. There's so much quality there. And I, I think, obviously, if you try and man-mark, I think Mayo will probably try and man-mark Khan and and Kieran, but you know there's still a, there's still a lot of other Dublin forwards that need to be looked at there. Obviously, Dean Rock, Niles Goody, uh, Cormac Costello who's having a great game. You know, Paddy Small, the likes of these. So, um, it's very difficult to to try and man mark each of them. But I do think you know Con and, and Kieran are the two that are the focal points for, for that Dublin attack. And probably from the, for the Leinster final, um, you know, Con in particular didn't have his best game, and you know that's a, a dangerous thing when. You're su such a good forward that, you know, you're the quiet game. They're always expecting to come out with um, a big game the next day. So, yeah, it, it, I think, you know, Mayo's way of, um, you know, trying to really um, defend against these teams is, 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 you know, obviously put the likes of Bushy Mullen and, and, and if Fish and Patrick Durkin will probably take up Kieran and Con. And, and, and it really is a running game, you know, tr trying to get the likes of these D the Dean Rocks and the Cormac Cosmos, trying to get them to defend more, the, more often than attack and, yeah, it, it, it's a, it'll be difficult. They probably haven't been firing on all cylinders like every other year. Um, you know, they've probably individually doing okay at times, but collectively have been have been struggling. Which it was a worry for Mayo. You think, um, will everything come together to say to that for that Dublin forward line? But you know, I do think it's key that Mayo keep their running game. You know, at, attack at all costs. Um, because that's the only way they really have to have a good start against Dublin and, and, and try not to concede too early and try and be in, in the game for, you know, down the final stretch and, and really put, put this Dublin team under pressure. It hasn't probably happened 
it this year and, and hasn't probably happened too many times in recent past. And, and I think Mayo have been the, been the best at doing that, being there with Dublin um, in, the, in the last two minutes of the game. And, and I, I think if they are the next day, that they, 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 can, they can really um, push them to get over the line. OK, Cora, uh, Enda McGinley, um, this time next week, we're meant to have Tyrone and Kerry playing the second semi-final in the All-Ireland Series for men. Um, uh, 50% of the Tyrone panel have uh, contracted COVID. Uh, what's the situation on the ground there at the moment, uh, Enda? Yeah, I suppose the, the one thing I'd say, I think the county border and team are handling very well. By that, I'm saying that there's very little talk about who has it or who hasn't got it. And I think that's just right for, for the players. But uh, even with that, I, I'm aware that there is several that uh, are definitely sick, sick with it. And uh, I think from just general knowledge, uh, people can feel very lethargic and well-drained energy, even just like a bad flu, although we know obviously COVID's a, a different kettle of fish, but uh, even with a bad flu, by the time you're over it, it still takes you a couple of weeks to get your full energy levels back. Uh, so for uh, the level that uh, these county players are supposed to be playing at, it's just about uh, the worst possible thing to have within a squad. Stomach bugs and stuff like that that might have happened, big numbers of squads beforehand, clear up within 48 hours and, and, and you're, you're away on absolutely fine. There's this lingering thing. And then there's the other thing that that, that, that moment in time, those them boys affected, but how do we know who's going to be affected in another week's time? And whenever it's that common within your squad and within the community that we're in up here, uh, then how do we know that the other players won't also have it? And is there going to be another round of testing and all of that? Will they, won't they? It's just about as far from ideal preparation that a team could have uh, both individually and collectively so yeah it's, it's just frustrating because there was great excitement after the Monaghan game there was great excitement after the Donegal game there was a sense that with the new management that, that really turned around from a league campaign that was up and down and obviously ended with the heavy carry defeat uh, there, there was a real sense that there was something coming and well uh, we, we would have been viewing Kerry as maybe a step too far like Kerry are a pretty special looking team at the minute we, we sort of felt it would be brilliant to see these boys go down and, and give it their best against Kerry. Uh, and I think everybody would, would like to see that. So uh, it'll be very disappointing. I think it's going to be very difficult for them to be, whether they fulfil the fixture or not is one thing, but it'll be very difficult for them to be the absolute best that they can be. Uh, and I struggle to see them having a, a good outcome un, unless they're absolutely right. Is it fair to have this match scheduled for next week in your view, Andy? In terms of giving Tyrone every chance to be at their best, then no, it's not. But we're living in extraordinary times. I can fully understand what the GA is doing. Uh, do I think that's set in stone the way it's sort of been indicated? I don't genuinely think it is. I think they'll be trying to read that if another week or two would mean that Tyrone would be in a position to go full, full out at it. Uh, then, then they would do that. But they'll be well aware that the same thing could happen the other squads as well. Uh, they'll be looking at the calendars like an old Troon club football has been progressing brilliantly up until now. But they've all we we play sort of half and half in terms of the league start games where you play your league games without your your county players, and then the other half of the league is played with the county players. We've played all the games, so the clubs are all now sitting idle. Uh, and while they'll take that for a couple of weeks, two three weeks. I think there'll be frustration then and in, in underneath that after that. Uh, so there's all of that balancing up to do. But look, any GA person, you, you want to see the big teams get a proper crack at it on the big stage. But I think we all have to be realistic. COVID isn't exactly something that, that allows normal things to occur uh, uninterrupted. Yeah, it's a 100-year thing. And uh, and like the, the, the finals were last December in hurling and football, Surely common sense can prevail and uh, there can be a little bit of a pause here. Uh, the lads can get back to full full match fitness in terms of their training and then be ready for a game. And you can have the match in a few weeks' time. Um, I think a club player would understand that. Yeah, it's, that is one potential thought that you could maybe... Uh, there's two things. Either you, you delay it now and uh, let the county go on ahead and just hold back the clubs or else you, you put a pause to the county season now and then play it off in December when last year's was played off. Neither is ideal at all. Like that, that, that latter suggestion, if I was a county player, I would absolutely hate that within any of the camps there because it's such a long time to be waiting uh, and trying to maintain things and going back to your club and disrupting all of that. So 
look, the, 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 the whole situation is a bit of a mess. Uh, unfortunately, it's on Trone's doorstep at the minute. The, the biggest hope is that the lads that are ill at the minute get well, that nobody else goes down with it, and that the team recovers and is still able to put the best foot forward against Kerry. But that's that's a whole lot of ifs and a whole lot of things going right, which doesn't feel like it's going to come to pass at the minute. Dennis, can you make head nor tail of this? I mean, from my perspective, just looking at, as a hurler on the ditch here, I, I don't see why they just can't reschedule this for a week or two later. Uh, they were able to move the football final to a Saturday, September the 4th this week. I don't understand why they can't push it back another couple of weeks. It doesn't seem like a huge deal for me. Is it a deal in the GA community? Uh, look, I think there's a big fear that it could happen again and again in another county. And, you know, that's, that's there's a risk here. If you go to try and play it in December, it could happen again in December. So it's the unknown about it, but my heart goes out to the players. I know in the lead up to the, the semi final and all that fun, you're doing absolutely everything to just to try and get yourself really in the best possible condition. You're sleeping, you're eating, all the rehab, all that. And to be hit with something like this, where there's no natural progression, it's not a hamstring where you're writing X amount of weeks, or it's not a, like a, a stomach bug where you're, you're writing 40 hours. This is unknown and it's different to each and every individual. So uh, it just it's really, really difficult for, for that squad and that team to yeah to try and you know peak is what you're trying to do, coming against the, the hot favourites for the all Ireland final, to try and peak in that position to, to win a game. You know, it's, it's going to be almost impossible, I'd say. Like, I don't know, maybe maybe Dennis and Cora didn't suffer this the way I did, but I know in big, big games, when you were physically at your absolute limit, the key, key thing for me was always, if I knew I'd trained solidly, if I knew I'd put in all the work, then no matter how tired I was feeling on the pitch, I would 100% know, well, there's no way that they're feeling so much better than me. Just dig in, just mentally tough it out and keep going. And it's sort of when you've got consistent training into it and you've looked after all your preparation, you know everything's perfect. You know out in that pitch, there's no excuses and you are every bit as fit as your opponent. And so whenever you are suffering, <laughs> no big game is won without a bit of suffering. Whenever you're at that absolute point, you know you, you'll, you'll match the opposition. For a throne player, it creates a major chink for me in, in the mental battle that goes on within any player whenever you're at that moment of pain, whenever you have to drive yourself on, whenever you have to believe that you will match your opponent step for step, that suddenly you're thinking, well, maybe I'm tired here because of COVID. Maybe this is a COVID thing. God, I'm feeling very tired today. Is it the COVID thing? And even having that wee chink in your armour on a stage like that in Croke Park, which is always a pitch that... that speeds up the game and really exposes any lack of fitness at all. Uh, it's it's just a it's a critical thing for drone players to be carrying into it. But uh, the only other thing is if ever there's a circling of the wagons moment and a call to arms, if the game does have to go ahead, I'd imagine that's what they'll be doing and it'll be it'll be blood and thunder and whatever else in the dressing room, but it'll be a moment to stand up and if it comes to it, I, I don't see drone forfeiting. Uh, I would I would hope that they'll have a team to at least fulfil the fixture if it has to be done but I don't think anybody ideally wants to see it won that way either no, no, no less in Kerry Yeah I suppose we've asked the questions and we examined the situation and uh, for, as, as a former All-Ireland winner with Tyrone yourself you know the players you know Brian Dewar you know Fergal Logan what do you want to see happen yourself what do you think you want to see happen at the moment It's, it's a matter of the, the team trying to prepare as well as they can in whatever fashion they can allowing for the boys that are isolated that hopefully the boys that are well but positive can still be training i'd imagine they're having their video reviews i'd imagine they're having their tactical discussions i'd imagine them boys will still be able to do pitch work albeit and isolated none of that is ideal but maybe enough of it is enough to keep them ticking over and ready then you're hoping for the boys to, to get sick from a management point of view they have to somehow manage that entire group and keep the mental approach that those excuses that i talk about that those excuses don't come into, that everything is handled, okay, this is grand, we can deal with this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to be fine, lads. And if this match is played next week, we're okay, we're good to go. That That's a difficult thing to, to do. Uh, but I know do her in particular, like, and, and they had it luck against Monaghan. They lost four, four defenders actually coming straight into that game. 
and they manned up. And again, I know the mood within the throne camp coming into that game, and it would be led by the likes of Doher. Doher, if ever there was any anti-excuse man, it was Brian Doher. It did not matter what was going on or what happened. You manned up and you get on with it, and you dealt with whatever the situation was. Now, this is an extreme one, even and it'll challenge even him to, to stick with that. But I have no doubt that a wee part of him will almost relish uh, the thought of if the team can get enough back and avoid others getting it, I think that would be a key thing for them to manage as well. Uh, then, then they'll be in a position to go out and just put in a, a massive, massive performance. And I think uh, it, it would be one that the county could be massively proud of if there's an opportunity for them to put in a famous, famous performance because of the thing coming into it. And opportunities like that can can really stir up a player group too to, to go and book. To, to go above and beyond. So I have no doubt Brian and Fergal will be trying to manage the situation and patch up where they need to patch up, get enough numbers there, and then take it on with with and, and leave the excuses at home whenever they cross that white line. But just, just to finish on this, uh, Enda, but from your perspective, like if you were to ask the GA anything, would you be asking for a postponement of this game in seven days' time from a fairness point of view? Yeah, I, I think you'd, you'd be looking at just one more week. Just give us one more week. If it's not right by that stage, then if you have to play it, then you have to play it. Uh, and, and we'll see how we are at that stage from a throne point of view. But I think just that that one additional week would make a massive difference for the boys that are sick. It would take the pressure off those that are recovering and allow others to sort of get their head around the situation and the team to get enough time training together uh, to be able to take on the match. So I'd imagine that that would be the least they would hope for. They would understand that the GA is in a, in a very tight situation. But as you were maybe indicating, one more week when you're this length, one more week, I think the clubs would be okay with that. I think the general public, for the greater good, I think it's worth doing. But as Dennis says, it can't be an endless thing. We know that because then what if another team comes down with it or what if Trone comes down with it again? And so all of them things, I think we, we have to be realistic. But a, an additional week, I think, would, would help. Unfortunate situation, isn't it, uh, Cora? There's nothing we, any of us can do about it, to be honest. <laughs> No, it is. It's hugely unfortunate. And, you know, your thoughts at this time, obviously, like it's with all the Trone players and whoever's contract to the virus is, as um, indirectly said, we just don't know what effect, um, you know, COVID has on each individual, um, you know, what physical effects, you know, you know, it can have long term physical effects. We hope it doesn't have any of that. But yeah, you, you know, you just want the, the, the players to get right and to get back healthy and, and fit again and, and hopefully at some stage be able to take the football pitch again but yeah it's 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 the times we live in you know as we said it's extraordinary times and you know these things are going to crop up and unfortunately it, it's cropped up in Toronto at a really bad time. Cora I know you you kind of feel that the ladies might have an uphill struggle um, against uh, Mayo in the, in the uh, Dublin in the 345 throw in the men's game at six uh, your head and your heart are they aligned Cora um, you, you're feeling confident you're feeling hopeful how are you feeling about it? Yeah, I don't know if they're aligned yet. You know, obviously your heart will always say Mayo. I, I do think it's go, it, it's going to be a tough one. I, I do think it's if it's if it's time where they can take Dublin, um, it could be um, this evening. Um, again, a, a lot to me will depend on the fitness of Oshin Mullen. I know he's only a young lad, but he is crucial to that Mayo that Mayo defence from a man marking point of view, but also from an attacking point of view. And I think it'll be just another huge blow. Obviously, with Killian not being this year, so. Um, I'm, I'm very much leaning towards the side of Mayo just, um, but I think everything has to go very right for us. So, yeah, I, I'm going to say Mayo by a point. Very good, uh, Cora Staunton. Dennis Bastic, are you confident? No, I wouldn't say I'm confident. No, you'd love to see a bit more, a few more goals going in in the run-up to this game, um, especially given the fact that how well it, both teams play against each other on, on the big days. But... You know, law of average is at some stage Dublin does ha have to lose a championship match, and it's almost seven years now, which is a really, really long time. So, you know, they do have to be have to lose at some stage, but I just don't think it's going to be today. I think there's enough there, there's enough to fall back on, there's enough uh, leadership experience just to just to get over this game. I think Dublin by three. Dublin by three. Mayo by one. That's the verdict of the red and green and the blue uh, corners. Uh, Enda McGinley, you're the referee. You're the man in the middle. Who, why, and by how many? Uh, look, I, I absolutely, I think just about everybody outside Dublin will be hoping that the Mayo tragedy ends. In fact, it could be the perfect 
final chapter for the Mayo tragedy that is bound to be a movie at some stage. If they beat Dublin and go on to lose the Ireland final, it would be just about the most Mayo of Mayo things to do. But what they have done, the way James Hoare, like that's a new team, a new exciting team. Uh, and the very fact that we're, we're all so excited about coming into it, like that's just what Mayo do. And the, the way they played that second half against Galway was you really started to believe that there was something there. Uh, but I just go back to, to thinking about Dublin and go back to that thing I said at the start about how Tyrone in 2008, whenever that a very good team was being really questioned properly for the first time, Kerry in 2009, superb team, really, really questioned for the first time. And they, they came out with massive responses. Dublin, like Dennis would probably tell us better, but looking in from the outside, I'd imagine quite often the Dublin dressing room is a very, very calm, business-like, professional environment, uh, pretty low on emotion uh, because the classic GA motivational factors of playing with a chip on the shoulder where you're questioned and where there's doubts about you and you want to go out and answer them doubts that really get the juices of, of, of us going. Uh, they, they haven't been there for that Dublin side and yet they're there today. Uh, and so I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what Dublin comes out. I think, I think it'll be a Dublin with more energy, more aggression, more bite than what we've seen. I think they'll be more ruthless in front of goal than they strangely were in the Lancer Championship where suddenly their their classic sort of really ultra-disciplined shot decision-making seemed, seemed off. Uh, I think that'll be back. They'll be, they will be on business and, and a force to be reckoned with. Mayo then, all the questions is on the Mayo side uh, in terms of their, their new players. Can they really stand up? Can they really uh, take down... Uh, a Dublin team they've played their National League campaign in Division 2 they've come through a, a relatively weak Connacht championship although they, they, they took Galway like Galway really had them in the back foot in the first half and yes they turned in a great second half performance but it's a lot to place a really good second half performance against Galway and somehow use that to outweigh the six years of evidence we've got of this Dublin side when it's practically the same Dublin team or a lot of the same Dublin players so uh, look for me this is Dublin's to win and, and potentially if they really click uh, to win well for Mayo I think it's a wee bit different than previous years where they went out and went toe to toe with Mayo throughout and know that's James Horn's style but for me Mayo nearly need to stay in this game stay in this game stay in this game and if that has to be a boring game then so be it and then hope to push for home in, in the final 20 minutes uh, the use of Kevin McLaughlin is going to be key for that potentially the positioning of Aidan O'Shea towards the latter end of the game could be something that James Warren looks to maybe turn the screw that way uh, but, but for Mayo it has to be to keep this game composed and quiet and hopefully meet what potentially could be a fired up Dublin keep the game settled, keep it tight and then push for home in the 20 minutes but I think if Dublin come with the fire I, I expect to see from them uh, I, I don't see Mayo being able to stick with them unfortunately Okay and then again Lee Cora Staunton Dennis Bastic great insight great conversation as always and off the ball thanks so much for joining us on the Saturday panel may the best teams win this weekend and have a great weekend the rest of the weekend yourselves thanks so much folks <laughs>